today, but I do know an anniversary today. And uh, John and Jesse are celebrating 32, 34 years today. So we don't have a happy anniversary song, but a happy anniversary. All right, let's stand and worship the Lord. Your cross, your cross, it draws me to your heart. It makes me blue, it makes my spirit sing. Your grace, your grace, oh, I hear it call my name. I'm waking up to sing, I'm waking up. Open up our hearts and for your praise is out. We will sing and shout, sing and shout. Open up our hearts and for your praise. Open up our hearts and pour your praises out And we will sing and shout, sing and shout Open up our hearts and pour your praises out We will sing and shout, sing and shout Open up our hearts and pour your praises out What could be better than the grace that washes all our shame away? What could be better than your friend, Lord? What could be better than the grace that leads us home and makes a way? What could be better than your friend, Lord? What could be? What could be better than the grace that washes all our shame away? What could be better than your friend, Lord? What could be better than the grace that leads us home and makes a way? What could be better than we will sing and shout, sing and shout, open up our hearts and pour your praises out. We will sing and shout, sing and shout, open up our hearts and pour your praises out. Oh, And we've gathered in your name, Lord, knowing that, Lord, because of all that you've done, Lord, through the demonstration of your great love, Lord, you've taken our sin, our shame. You've bared our burdens, Lord, and you've gone to the cross, Lord, and you've triumphed over the cross. You've triumphed over sin and death. And we come in, Lord, and we just say thank you and we praise you. Lord, you com we come into your presence, Lord, as a multitude, but, Lord, you see hearts, Lord, and you see 
the individual needs, Lord. And some, some come with heavy hearts, Lord. Some come with light hearts, Lord. Some come with great burdens. And Lord, we just look to you and we, we lay everything down at your feet this morning. Because, Lord, you are worthy and you have a plan and a purpose that is unique and fitted for each one of us. And we come and we celebrate and we thank you, Lord, that this world isn't the end, Lord. Oh, Lord, you're preparing us, you're equipping us. And so, Lord, we come, we gather, and we ask your Holy Spirit to do that work in our heart, Lord. Lord, that we might sing and worship and praise you, Lord, that we might just express the joy that's in our heart, Lord. So, Lord, take hold of our hearts, take hold of this time. And it's in Jesus' name that everyone said, amen. You may be seated. Um, we want to try a new one, so. We are your church We are your sons and daughters we gather here to be here. We lift our eyes. We lay our hearts before you. Expectant here for you to move. With our hands. To the heavens alive in your presence, oh God, when you come, so pour out your spirit, we love to be near you, oh God, when you come. We are your church, we are your sons and daughters. We are your church, we are your sons and daughters, we've gathered here to be with you. We lift our eyes, we lay our hearts before you. Expected here for you to move. With our hands to the heavens alive in your presence, oh God, when you come, so pour out your spirit, we love to be near you, oh God, when you come. You are the way. You are the way. The truth and life we live for. Oh, how we long to know you more. The hands to the heavens alive in your presence, oh God, when you come. Come with our hands, with our hands to the heavens alive in your presence, oh God. When you come, so pour out your spirit to love to be near you, oh God. When you come, come like a rushing wind. Come like the fire again. Come like a burning flame. Have your way. Have your way. Come like a rushing wind. Come like the fire again. Come like a burning flame. Have your way. 
give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you. your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise God, my 
to see the angels and the cherubim and the seraphim around your throne Lord crying holy 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 is the Lord God almighty who was and who is and who is to come oh Lord Father God we thank you Lord Lord thank you for those times you give us a glimpse Lord but open our eyes to see your presence Lord Lord you truly are holy Lord and we know that we are not but we are so thankful Lord that you are doing a work in us Lord and that through Jesus Christ Lord you see us as your spotless blameless bride Lord Lord continue to do that work in us Lord Continue to mold us and to conform us and to transform our mind, Lord, through the renewing of our mind, through your word, Lord. Wash us clean this morning, Lord. Father, our hearts are ready. We want to receive from you, Lord. Lord, we pray, Lord, that your word would burn in our hearts today, Lord. Receive our worship. Receive our praise, Lord. And bless your children and their youth as they go to Sunday school now, Lord. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Go ahead and stand up. Children, you're dismissed, and youth, you're dismissed as well. Uh, and we'll sing one more song. Pastor Bob will come on up. And, uh... You are the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord must hide. Your head in glory and creation will now reveal our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. Didn't want heaven without So Jesus, you What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Yeah, good night, oh. Before you, 
indeed what a wonderful name it is the name of Jesus Christ the name above all other names there is none that is greater there is none that strikes joy and excitement in the heart of those who know him than his name and we've come to worship that one this morning to worship Jesus Christ for the great work that he has done in our hearts and our lives and for the great work that he's going to do this morning. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. We call you Father because you are our Father. We hallow your name for it is worthy of exaltation. There is no other name like this one. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Bless our time together this morning in your word. And Lord, we just want to give you praise and thanks for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. You may be seated. And <clears throat> as you're sitting down, <laughs> turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 7 this morning. We will pick it up again in verse 13 today. But by way of, you know what, I'm sorry. Beginning in verse 13, let's read together. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few that find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Not everyone that, who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching 
for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So this morning, Lord, we thank you for your word. We ask that you would bless the teaching of it, Lord. In spite of me, Lord, I pray that you would bless your people. More than anything else, my desire is today that I would be found behind the cross of Christ, and that he would be exalted, and all praise and glory being given to him, and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, there's much to cover in the end of this chapter, and to be honest with you, we could probably spend about three or four weeks here just taking it section by section, but we're not going to do that today. I'm going to try to finish the whole chapter. But there are many, many things that, that God wants to say to us, I believe, in this section of Scripture that apply to us in our everyday life. And now, I say that with great confidence because that's every bit of God's Word all the time. That's not something new. That's something that's, you know, that is the given, if you will, that when we come to the Word of God, that God has a purpose in our reading it and studying it because He wants to affect our heart and our life for change. That's the whole thing. That's why He's given us His Word. It's, it's to lay out things for us so that we will know how to live. And that's what this whole, this whole Sermon on the Mount has been. It's been about how to live our life in Christ. And the comparison, of course, has been to the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Jesus is always bringing up, you know, these examples of them, the, their prayer, uh, the things that they would do. And, and he would say, don't be like them. Don't be hypocrites. You know, there's, there's nothing worse than a hypocrite, to be honest with you, right? The world can spot one in a heartbeat. I love little kids. You know why I love little kids? Because, man, I mean to tell you, they are just straight up and honest with you. You ever had one tell you one day, you know, you, you eat garlic that night, you go out for Italian food or something. I come into church in the morning, I go to give one of the little kids a hug, and they go, oh, your breath stinks. <laughs> now, you guys won't tell me that because you're too kind. You just want me to hurry up and finish my conversation so you can get out of there. But a little kid, they're just flat out honest, man. They're straight up with things. There's no hypocrisy in them. They learn that from us later, but, you know, that's the whole point. You know, the world can see a hypocrite. Children can see a hypocrite. You know, we just want to make sure that, that we are not that. Now, having said that, we all have fault. We all have weakness in our lives. We're not perfect, but we're proclaiming a very perfect God and a very perfect standard of living by which he calls us to. And as a matter of fact, you remember early on in chapter 5 when Jesus, in verse 20, told his disciples, he said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you won't enter into the kingdom of heaven. That had to be a very frightening thing to them because of the fact they looked at those people as having it. They, they knew what they needed to do. They knew how to do it. And because of that, you know, they were going to, they were going to be the ones that were going to make it. Where well, we're going to find out this morning as we're reading in this passage here that that's not necessarily true. He says there's going to be those that are going to come to him in that day and they're going to say, Lord, Lord. And he's going to say, guess what? You little clown, I never knew you. You see, that's, that's the crux of the whole message of the Sermon on the Mount is knowing Christ. And living in such a way because of knowing Christ. And not because we want to try to establish our own righteousness through the good things that we do. Although Jesus makes it very clear that we are to do good things. That other men would see them and then God would be glorified. Not us. But the, the Pharisees, they had it where they wanted to do those good things so that it drew attention to them that men would praise them. And not only that, you know, that they would be praised among themselves. You know, I, I, I really love the Apostle Paul and how he lived such a life before he came to Christ in that manner. He, he tells us in Galatians that he excelled beyond all his contemporaries. There's little doubt in my mind at all that what Paul had in mind in his life was he was going to be the top dog. He was going to be the Pharisee that everybody looked to. He was going to become one of those great rabbis like Gamaliel, the one who he sat under. But when he came to faith in Christ, he realized that all those things that he was doing, he was doing it for himself. He was doing it for his own glory. 
I think that Paul had a love for God, and I think that's why God reached out to him, knocked him off his horse to get his attention, to come to faith, genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But he himself says about those things that he considered all that as nothing more than just a big pile of cow manure. That's what he saw it all as, because it was all about himself. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, is pointing us toward something that was very radical and different in their day. It was that you were to have a relationship with God. Now, we know that in order to have that relationship with God, it must be through Jesus Christ. And this is one of the things he says here in verse 13. He says, enter in by the narrow gate. You know, yesterday in sharing uh, with the folks that came to receive those meals, uh, I pointed out to them that there's only one way that you're going to get in. Even though there, there are many paths that are out there, there's only one path that is the right path. And even though it may appear that there are many ways, many gates that are open, there's only one gate that is open. And that is the one through Jesus Christ. And it's very narrow. Now the sad thing about that would be is if it was hidden, if it wasn't accessible by all, but only by a, a limited few that could find that gate. But God has made sure that everyone will have access to that narrow gate. But Jesus is pointing out that when you find that narrow gate, you must go through it. You can't just stand back and look at it and hope that you'll get in. You cannot think that I'll try a different means in order to circumvent, to get around that particular gate. Jesus says, no. He said, that gate is narrow. And he gives the contrast to that. He says, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. There are many people that refuse Jesus Christ and the work that he's done on the cross for the forgiveness of their sins, and they think somehow or another they're going to make it in because they're good people, because they do good things, because God is love, and God loves everybody. So therefore, God will make an exception when it comes to me. When it comes my time to stand before the Lord, I know that I'm going to be all right, because me and the man upstairs, we got a thing going on. That's not the way it works. He's not the man upstairs for one thing. He is our father. We learned that back in chapter five. He's our father. And his name is to be hallowed because there is none other that is like him. None, there's none that compares. There's no other way except for that. But many will try. You know, it's the unfortunate thing that in that day when we stand before the Lord and the white throne judgment comes, there are going to be just millions and millions and millions and millions and billions of souls that are going to be destined to hell because they refuse to go in through the narrow gate. He's provided the way. His grace and his mercy says, come, all that will come shall enter in. Anybody that wants to can. But so many say, no, I don't want to do that. I want to go my own way. And broad is that way that leads to destruction. So many will choose that way. If we know Christ today, of course, we've made that decision to go in through that narrow gate. But believe me, there's times when people who know Christ, they try to back up and choose some other gates to go through rather than staying on the narrow way, the narrow path. It is a very narrow path. And it's difficult it says, verse 14, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to wife, li not, not wife, honey, I'm sorry, and to life, and there are few who find it. You see, Proverbs 14, 12 tells us, it says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. We can be deceived. You know, this is the, if, this is the precarious portion of the whole thing. And that is, is that we can be deceived. Now, God has made a way so that the, we won't be deceived, and that's what we've been talking about is God and his word and it transforming our life. So it's not like we have to be afraid, but we have to be aware 
that deception can come. And I'm going to talk about that a whole lot more when we get down here into the false prophets and how they deceive many. They take many people astray from the narrow way. And the only way that I can know that I'm on that path is if I stay connected to God and his word and that I judge all things according to his word. One of the big problems for the church today is many of the things that are going on in the church are not judged by God's word, but by our culture and the days in which we live in right now. And that becomes a problem because in case you hadn't noticed, things change. Things change, but they don't change either. You know, there are issues in our culture and our society, very sinful things that are going on that are kind of new for us because they were not a part of my life as I was growing up as a child. The, 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 the things that are out there that are available now were not there. You know, I, I think of something like pornography, which is so accessible now that, I mean, it, it's just incredible. It, it's so easy to obtain this filth where when I was a kid growing up, boy, believe me, those kind of things were on eight millimeter films up in some guy's closet, man, that, you know, that didn't just come out because it was a very vile and nasty thing. And there were few that had those kind of things. Now there are many. But don't think that it's new because it's not. You know, Satan and his devices are the same from the beginning. In the garden, his methods, his means by which he entices and draws people in are still the same. It's all about the world, the flesh, and the devil. It's all about the pride of life. It's about being independent. You know, this is one of the, the biggest obstacles to people trying the narrow gate because they want to be independent. You know, no, I don't want to do it God's way. You know, a lot of people are fine when I start talking about Jesus until I tell them they have to become his slave. I'm no slave of anybody. Well, yes, you are. You're slave to your own fleshly desires. You're slave to you know, things of this world. Even though you may think that you're free and that you're independent, you're not. You're like a puppet on strings being manipulated by the forces of darkness which take you. And the Bible says that you are captive to that sin, that you're incapable of being able to go a different direction unless you've been set free, unless those strings have been cut by the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but its way leads to death. But in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, familiar to many of you, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. There you go. Okay, yes, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but it leads to death. Well, how do I keep from going there? Well, it's real simple. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. That means give yourself over completely to him. You understand what that means to say, I trust the Lord with all of my heart. Let me, let me interpret that. It says, I belong to Jesus Christ and I want to do whatever he wants me to do with my life when he wants me to do it in my life. That's what it means to do that. And if we're willing to do that and we're willing to trust in him and to look to him, then he will change our heart and he will guide our paths. Remember when we were going through our series in chapter five on the Lord's, or chapter six, I'm sorry, on the Lord's prayer. That one of the things that we established is that the purpose of prayer is not to bring God's will in alignment with my will, but quite the opposite, to align my will with his. What is his will for my life? What is it that he wants for me and from me? What is it that God desires that the end of my life would look like. And all the steps between the beginning and the end are ordered by the Lord. And if I will trust in him with all my heart, he will expose that path, those steps to me. But I have to be willing to say, Lord, your will be done, not my will be done. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That same kind of idea. There is a way that that's, uh, seems right to a man, and then there is the way that is right for the man. And the way that we learn that, the way that we discern that, is by following hard after Christ. 
You see, Jesus said the way is difficult. It's hard. It's hard, and it is. You know, even though you know, I've walked with the Lord now for 42 years, I can tell you this, it's not any easier to walk with the Lord today than it was 42 years ago when I accepted Christ. But I have learned and I've been disciplined over those years knowing that it's the better way so I'm willing to do the hard thing. That I'm not always looking for the easy thing. There's one thing I discovered about myself years ago after coming to faith in Christ. That I'm always looking for the easy way. The easy way out. I want it to be, you know, it's got to be fast, it's got to be good, and it's got to be done, and that's that. I'm done with the whole thing. Huge problem for me in my walk with Christ when I first started out. You see, because I wanted to be 60 years old in the Lord when I was only six years old in the Lord. I wanted to have that kind of relationship experience and that knowledge of God without putting in the time and the effort in order to do that. I've shared with you about my experience with Dr. Van Cleve and how, you know, the man, he just oozed the Holy Spirit. I just admired him so much. He was such a man of God who when he got up there and he began to preach and to teach us I mean, you could just, the spirit just reeked out of the man. And I was going home from class one night, and I told the Lord, I said, man, Lord, I want to be a man of God like doc, Dr. Van Cleve. And he spoke to me so clearly, and he said, you will when you've walked with me for 65 years, like he has. Oh, you mean you got to do the time? <laughs> I, I, you know, I didn't understand that. I'm, I've been one of those that in my life I've been very blessed that that things come easy to me. When I started building cabinets, it wasn't a huge effort. I took to it very naturally, very quickly. The Lord excelled me quickly within the companies which I worked in and stuff. Even though I had little experience, I was put in positions of guys who had a lot of experience kind of thing. And that's been to my detriment. Things coming easy like that, I expect everything to come easy like that. And when it doesn't, you know what I want to do? I want to quit. I just want to quit. It's a perfectionist in me. That if it doesn't come out right, and if it doesn't come out right the first time when I do it, then I'll just quit. I won't do it anymore. It doesn't work out too well. When it comes to Jesus, we're in it for the long haul. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's a lifelong race that we run. And time to time, we stumble, we fall. But the important thing is, just like this, you know, you get up and you run again. Don't we all admire the, the marathoner who's out there running, he trips and he falls and he hurts himself and he's so banged up that he, that he can just barely get up. But hours and hours later, he crosses the finish line because he wouldn't quit. And we, we give him that honor just as we did the one that won the race, to be honest with you. As a matter of fact, in some degrees, even a greater honor because he was willing to stick with it or her, whoever it may be. So it is too in our walk with Christ. You see, the way is both narrow and difficult, but it leads to life. And that's what keeps us going. That's what keeps us plodding along on our trail. And the reason that it is difficult is because it's the way of death. It's the way of death. Jesus said in John 12, 25, he who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. The secret, the key is dying to yourself. He told us that in chapter six, that we are to take up our cross and to follow after him. That we're to be anxious about none of the things that we have need of because of the fact that he is our provider, our protector, and our keeper. And the way that we find ourselves in that place is by dying to our self, our own selfish desires. This is what God calls us to. And if we really want to have life, that's where we're going to find it, is in death, in dying to self. That's where you're going to find life. You know, and and if you want to have a life that's fulfilling here, the more you die to yourself and live for Christ, the more of that life you will experience. Jesus said that he had come to give life, and that more abundantly. Not just eternal life, but an abundant life here. 
Now, if you're thinking abundant means rich, famous, good-looking, I'm the only one that gets that. Everybody else has to settle for second best. Of course, you know I'm joking. I'm neither rich, good-looking, or anything else, so it doesn't matter. The point is, I, I, I consider myself to have an extremely abundant life. I have a very good life. You know, I've got the Lord. I've got a beautiful wife and daughter. You know, I got a roof over my head that my daughter supplies. I train her up so that when I get old, she'll be used to it already. Okay? I'm getting old quick, you know, I, I realize that. So, you know, I've, I've got a good life. I really do. I cannot complain about it. And I can't complain about how my life has gone either, the past of my life. It's all been good, even though there are times that have been difficult. It is difficult because we battle between the flesh and the spirit. We, we do. We fight against the flesh and the spirit. The flesh is always wanting to take over. We talked about that to some degree uh, just a little bit when we were studying prayer. You know, the phenomenon about we know that prayer is good, we know that prayer is right, we know that God answers prayer, but yet there are times when I sit down to pray that I'm thinking to myself in my mind, I don't want to do this. I don't want to, I don't want to pray. And that's because there's a battle that's taking place, place there between the flesh and the spirit. My flesh says, oh, don't do that. You know, God already knows everything anyways. You don't need to do that. Well, yeah, I do. I, I need to have a conversation with my Father in heaven. And my spirit wins out, praise be to the Lord. But my flesh is battling. And there are other things that go on in my life. It's the same thing. To walk that narrow path, to go the way that God wants me to go. There are times when my flesh says, no, let's, let's take the shortcut. Let's take the easy way. No, let's don't do it at all. But the only way that I can stay on that path is by staying in God's word, staying near to him, fellowship, prayer, breaking of bread together, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. These things are all necessary in our life in order to be able to walk on that narrow path. And you know, it's amazing to me how we'll settle for second best at a minimum and the rough road that is there we seem to tolerate but the difficult road that there is to walking on the narrow path is one that we despise we begin to hate it but yet it's the best one it's the best as i've gotten older it's a little bit easier for me to to stay on that path because of the fact that i realize the futility of getting off that path you know, I've shared with you before, you know, I'm one of those knuckleheads that usually has to suffer things greatly before I'm willing to stop doing what I need to stop doing. And it's been that way all my life. But I am pleased that as I've gotten older, we just don't go down that path anymore. I've learned my lessons and I go on. Walk the way that God wants me to walk. Do his will in my life to the best of my ability. You see, when we started out, we were talking about the hypocrite. In some sense or another, we're all hypocrites because we say one thing and we do another. But when it's in your heart to do what is right and you stumble and fall and you get up and you go again, that's not being hypocritical. That's being human. That's what happens to us. What's important is that we get up and we continue on. And no matter how difficult the path may be, God has something better for us at the end of that path than you'll ever find on any other path that you would choose. I think it's important to realize that, that God gives us a choice. We, we choose. Do we want the, you want the high road or you want the low road? You know, do you want the broad way or do you want the narrow way? Do you want the gate that leads to eternal life or do you want the gate that leads to destruction? Which do you want? It's yours. As they say, what would you choose today, smoking or non? Non-smoking, hopefully. Verse 15, Jesus says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Jesus warned us of a path that leads to destruction. Now he reminds us that there are many who would try to guide us along the broad path that leads to destruction. The first step to Batting these false prophets is to simply be aware of them. There are plenty of false prophets to go around today. 
And I could sit up here all day and I could give you this huge long list of people that I truly consider to be false prophets today. But this is what I would rather do. I would rather that you would study the Word of God, that you would know the Word of God, and when somebody tells you something, that you would be able to compare what they say to the Word of God, just like the Bereans, the, the people that Paul commended. He said, you know what? You guys, you went and you tested the things that I told you. You went to the Old Testament, rolled out the scrolls, looked up these things to see if what he said was true. And Paul commended them for that. You see, here's one of the, the lacking within the church today is spiritual discernment. And the reason is because we lack spiritual knowledge of the Word of God. You know, if you know the Word of God, when somebody says something, then you can spot it as being heretical or maybe even off just a little bit. You see, heresy and the drawing away doesn't come usually in huge leaps and bounds. It's usually a little deception here, a little deception there, and it begins to take you off the narrow path and leading you to another path. And so it's important that we're aware of the fact that there are those that are out there today that are. One of the things that you have to understand is if you have somebody that's teaching and they're unwilling to teach the whole word, they're will, unwilling to say the things that are obvious in God's word and that are true, and they're reluctant to even say or mention it or to even acknowledge it, then let me tell you something. Run far and fast away from their teachings. Because you want somebody that's going to teach the Word of God without any kind of apology, without any hesitation to speak the whole truth. You know what? Because i got to tell you, it's not always easy to do. It's not easy to stand up here and to say different things to you guys that I do. You guys might think I really like it or something. You know, I, I love to beat the sheep, but my wife stops me every week. That's not true. I don't. And, and there are times that I know that there are things that I say that are, are difficult. You know, the whole exhortation of being in the Word every day, staying on that narrow path and those kind of things. You know what? There are plenty of teachers that are, that are out there that will tell you, you don't have to do that. It's okay. God doesn't care. Just do whatever you want. It's all under grace, you know. It's all under love. And, and, and that statement is such a, a, a large misrepresentation of the truth of God's word. God is love, and God loves us. And God will accept us even though we're sinners if we'll repent of our sin. But to think that it's some kind of universal blanket is totally unscriptural. And if somebody's saying those kind of things, then don't listen to them. Because what they're saying is not true. And you know, it's kind of like this. If you know a glass of water has some dirt in it, and you can see it at the bottom of the glass, and you're thirsty, so you start taking a drink, and you're hoping you can get you know, enough water to be satisfied without getting into the dirt, and there's another glass of water that's over here that's perfectly clean, don't mess with the one with the dirt. Choose the one that's clean. God's Word know it learn it understand it apply it into your life and then that way when somebody shows you a glass and it's got a little dirt down here in the bottom you can say no there's a better glass over here i think i'll take that one there are those that are out there paul warned the ephesian elders in acts chapter 20 verses 29 and 30 he said for i know this that after my departure savage wolves will come in among you not sparing the flock also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Paul warned them that this is what was going to happen when he left. Because when, you know, the big sheepdog is no longer there, the wolves come in after the sheep. That's what they do. And you, you know how you can know if somebody's a wolf? By what they eat. They don't eat grass, they eat sheep. And they draw people unto themselves. They build kingdoms for themselves. It's all about having all kinds of notoriety and size and buildings and cars and jet planes. And as far as I can tell, that's not really the kingdom of God. That's building our own kingdom. That's why you guys need to buy me a Mercedes next week. 
Just kidding. Just kidding. I don't need a Mercedes. I couldn't afford to maintain it if I had one. Okay? And that's okay with me. I'm fine. Barclay said the basic fault of false prophet of the false prophet is self-interest. Self-interest. It can be expressed by a desire for gain or easy life, a desire for prestige, or the desire to advance one's own ideas and not God's ideas. Verse 16. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? We guard ourselves against false prophets by taking heed to their fruits. This means paying attention to several aspects of their life and their ministry. We should pay attention to the manner of living a teacher shows. Do they show righteousness, humility, and faithfulness in the way that they live? Let me add a little bit more to that. Is the person who's in the pulpit the same when he's in the pulpit outside of the pulpit? Is he the same guy? Does he live the same way? Does he do the things that he says that he does? That's important. I do personally know men that that's not the case. And their sheep see it and they tell me about it. How they don't like it because the way their pastor appears when he's up front is much different than when they see him outside of the pulpit. That's, that's where it gets into the whole Pharisee and Sadducee thing and hypocrisy and those kind of very things that Jesus warns against. So when we are looking at someone and examining the fruit, remember, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment, but, you know, last week as we looked into the whole thing about judging, it isn't that Jesus said that we were not to judge, but that we were to make sure that we were being introspective before we were looking outwardly. Clean up your own life before you start looking, you know, take the log out of your own eye before you start trying to take the speck out of somebody else's. This is very important. But Jesus is telling us here, we are definitely to be fruit inspectors. People who will look at what's going on with people as they're teaching and whether or not they are truly doing that. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, we know this, that in the last days that there would be perilous times, that men would be lovers of selves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, and having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such turn away. That warning that Paul gives Timothy is about those who are in the church in the church and so we know that there are those that will rise up among us Paul gives us warning Jesus gives us warning we just need to pay attention to what they're saying the content of their teaching if it is true fruit from God's word or if it is man-centered appealing to the ears that want to be tickled we need to discern that as we listen to people in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, it says, For a time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. We should pay attention to the effect of their teaching in people's lives. Verse 17, Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear, good, uh, bear bad fruit, nor can, it, can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. In Jesus' evaluation, the Pharisees were obviously producing bad fruit. The only thing to do with bad trees is to cut them down and to destroy them. If they do not fulfill their purpose for existence, they should be removed. And and so we are told here, it's it's a Jesus once again he uses something very natural to explain to us the logic behind those who are good teachers and those who are bad, you know, false teachers and correct teachers. He says, You're going to see fruit, and from a bad tree, you're not gonna have good fruit. It's just not gonna come. And so He's using that to appeal to our logic that as you look at these things, then you can judge whether or not it's good and correct. Verse 20, therefore, by their fruits you will know them. 
like I said, remember that Jesus told us that before we do this, that we need to examine ourselves before we examine others. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So Jesus says there's going to come a day that people are going to stand before him and they're going to be expecting that they're going to be able to come in to the kingdom of heaven because they did all these good works. Now let's keep in mind, you know, that Jesus is talking about the Pharisees here particularly, but certainly there's application for ourselves. John Trapp had this to say he said this warning of jesus applies to people who say lord lord and yet their spiritual life has nothing to do with their daily life they go uh, to church perhaps fulfill some daily religious duties yet sin against god and man just as any as any other might there are those who speak like angels live like devils and have jacob's smooth tongue but esau's rough hands so it's real simple. Je- you know, the application for us today is if you are coming to church on Sundays and you're saying, praise the Lord, glory, hallelujah, bless his holy name, and then you're living like hell Monday through Saturday and you come back to church on Sunday because you think getting here on Sunday and saying, praise the Lord, hallelujah, is going to do something for you, or as Jesus says, Lord, Lord, and you think that's going to do something for you, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. The whole idea behind this is that we are living for God 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's it. You know, and and Jesus says this is how important it is. If you think that you can have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of heaven, there's great risk that's involved. You have to have both feet firmly planted in the kingdom if you want in the kingdom if you want to get there. That's the only assurance, the absolute assurance that you have is that your heart is connected to God and that you are in the kingdom, that you're living for the kingdom each and every day. It's like this. It's like living like you do in front of others when there's nobody there because you know that you're in the presence of God Almighty and that he sees and he knows everything that you do, that you think, and that you say. And face it, if Jesus was standing in front of you, the actions of your life would quickly be dictated by his presence would they not if you saw him physically you would make sure that you you know there wouldn't be that freudian slip of foul language or any of that kind of stuff because you oh man no way am i but yet we'll use that kind of language in our mind in our heart not realizing that jesus is hearing everything that we're saying and cursing people not just cursing at them but cursing them hating them. Remember we talked about this in chapter 5 when Jesus said if you hate your brother that you've committed murder. Jesus has taken it all and brought it into that spectrum, that place to where it's all about personal relationship with God 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 and a quarter days per year. That's what it's all about. And we deceive ourselves if we think that there is really anything else to Christianity outside of that. And if we think that, that it's acceptable to God to be carnal, to live fleshly, to live in the world, you know, and, and to live sinfully, then we are deceived because that's not why Jesus came and died for us. He came and died so that we could be set free, so that we could walk that walk of the narrow path, so that we could have a life that reflects the goodness of God and the works of God in us so that others might see that and that he would be glorified. More and more in my life, what's important to me is the actions of my life so that others would see that I am who I say that I am and that in that, that God would be glorified. I run into this often And that is, I have people that'll come up to me that I don't know, and they'll say, hey, aren't you Pastor Bob? 
with a beard like mine, it kind of stands out. And I'll say, well, yes, I am. And they'll say, yeah, I came to your church once. And I'm thinking to myself, boy, am I glad I wasn't doing something stupid. I'm glad I was being the man out there that I am in the pulpit so that when others see me, that it doesn't drag the name of Jesus through the mud. That they see the good works in my life and my Father in heaven is glorified. Because that, to be honest with you, that is the drive of my life. It's not just a little part of me. It is the drive of my life. Now, I, don't, don't get me wrong. I, I certainly am not perfect, and most of you know me well enough to know that I am not perfect. But there's one thing for sure. I desire perfection in my life. I desire that God would clean me up, that he would take those things out of my life, that he would take away my bad temper, that he would take away my bad attitude, that he would take away all these things that cause offense to people. God is in that process in my life. And, and, and I'm not unhappy with the way things are going. Could it go better? Yes. But I know where my heart is. I know where I want to be. And so, you know, that's, that's all I can do is be on the path, right? How far along on that path, I cannot dictate. But I'm on the path, the narrow path. We see here, in the end, there is one basis of salvation. It, it's, it's the mere, it's not the mere verbal confession. Lord, Lord. That is not what God is looking for from us, but it is knowing Jesus and being known by him. Personal, intimate relationship. You know, there are a lot of guys that are out there that are, uh, that are if you will, you know, some of the big heavyweights in our movement as far as preachers and teachers and all that kind of stuff. You know, and one of the things that I love about the Calvary movement is that the major majority, not all, but the major majority of the guys that are involved, guys that have large churches and everything, they're very humble men, and they don't care about that. And sometimes, you know, I get a little, it's like, wow, I can't believe it. I'm friends with this guy, and I'm friends with this guy. You know, I'm just a little guy from the cow town of Sacramento, a little church, you know, and here they are, these huge ministries, you know? And I, I'm amazed that, that I have friendships with them. You know, Raul Reese, which is someone that I came out of his church back in 1989, and when I see him, even though I only see him about once a year, he come, he said, Bob, how are you doing? Are you still up there in Sacramento? You know, and Raul's got a huge ministry. He preaches all over the world. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things. And I think to myself, who am I? I'm nobody. But yet he knows me. Well, you know, guess what? I'm nobody. But Jesus knows me. And I know him. And that's more important to me than my relationship with Raul. I'm impressed with, with that whole thing. But I'm a whole lot more impressed with my relationship with Jesus Christ than I am any man living. There is none that even begins to compare to who Jesus is. That's what God wants for us and from us, to be connected to him. Verse 24, Therefore, who hear, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will like him, liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Not on our religiosity, but based upon the inward relationship with the true and living God, this saying here includes all that has been shared with us in this sermon. Jesus is pointing back to the very beginning of this, and he says, if you'll listen to these things that I've been teaching you, then what I'm going to liken you to, and if you'll apply them to your life, I'm going to liken you to the wise man, to the wise man. Because, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Because this is what we can count on. There will be storms in our life. There will be floods. There will be strong winds. There will be all these things that will try to bring destruction in our life. But if we're standing on the rock, we're standing on the things that Jesus teaches us, then we're going to be able to stand. And he's going to carry us through all those difficulties in our life if we'll listen to what he has to say. But this is what he says of those who don't listen to what he says. He's but everyone who hears these things of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. 
And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. One of the things that I enjoy about my relationship with Christ is that there are always choices to be made. I'm not a robot. You know, he doesn't just chink, 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 chink. You know, there, we go along this path and we have to make a choice. We're going to do what God wants or am I going to do what I want? Which am I going to choose? I enjoy that portion of my relationship with God because I, I enjoy having that freedom but yet knowing what's best for me to choose. It's like, oh, yeah, man. I, I'm, I'm going to go your way, Lord, because I know it's going to be good. And many times it's, it, it's better than, I almost said more gooder. That's not a good word. Uh, it's better than what I even anticipate that it would be. It's, it's far better than what I'd even hoped for in following after him. And if we choose the right way, then we'll be wise. But if we choose the wrong way, then we'll be foolish in our life. Verse 28, and so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. His audience could not but notice that Jesus taught with an authority lacking in other teachers in his day who often only quoted other rabbis. Jesus spoke with inherent authority and the authority of God's revealed word. Jesus spoke because he's the one that wrote the word. He is the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word of God was God. And Jesus is the word. He wrote the word. He is the one that could interpret it with 100% accuracy. That's why we can take these sayings of his and we can apply them into our life and be assured of this, that none of it will lead us in the wrong direction. None of it. There's not one little jot or tittle that we have to concern ourselves with, the two smallest marks in the Hebrew language. Even those small marks, we do not have to worry or concern ourselves about being led astray. He spoke about false prophets. He spoke about those who do lead people astray. But Jesus is not one of them. Jesus is the prophet. He's a prophet that was prophesied in Genesis and Exodus. He's the one that God had promised would come to take away the sins of the world. And we can count on every word that he said. And so just as he appealed to our logic when he said that good fruit comes from a good tree, bad fruit from a bad tree, he appeals to that logic sense. He appeals to our logic sense once again to choose the narrow path, the narrow gate, the difficult way at times, but the most profitable. He tells us that you can count on him when he says, don't worry about anything because I got it covered. I'm going to supply your house, your, your food, your, your car, your, your clothes, everything. I'm going to supply all that. Don't worry about anything. I got it covered. You can take that to the bank. That's better than having a million dollars in the bank because our, our currency could become worth zero tomorrow, but God's currency never devalues. It's always profitable, and it's always good. Well, when we really understand Jesus in this Sermon on the Mount, we should be astonished also, knowing that he spoke with such great authority because he had the authority. And if we're not astonished, then we probably haven't really heard or understood what Jesus has said. We should marvel when we read the sayings of Jesus Christ, not only his, but I mean, we're, we're talking about Jesus right now, so let's just focus there, right? But I guarantee you there's nothing between the pages of, gen, you know, from the index in the front that gives you where all the books are to the last page of the book of Revelation. There's nothing in between there that we cannot take and use in our heart, in our life. God wants to do that with you each and every day. He wants to minister to your heart and your life. But, like I said, we make choices. And God will never force that on you. He will never force you to be disciplined, to read his word, and to pray. He'll never force you into that. Now, he might let some consequences in your life drive him towards that direction. 
But what I've found a lot of times when that happens, just as quick as it comes, it goes. It's when we determine in our heart that we love him and that we want to do is spend time with him, that we want to know him better, that I want to know what he has to say because I know that what I have to say, there is a way that seems right unto a man which leads to destruction. I already know that about myself. But his way always leads to health, to good. And when I say health, I'm talking about spiritually. Health is not a promise, you know. And, and you know, that's the whole thing. We all know that we're going to die someday. We're going to die of something. And it's usually something that is unhealthy, right? But God promises us that we can have life in that more abundantly. Would you bow your hearts with me in prayer this morning? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what it speaks to our heart. We pray, God, that you would strengthen us and encourage us as we come to your words. And, and Lord, that you would just refresh us, renew us, and speak to us by the power of your Holy Spirit. That, Lord, it wouldn't just be words on a page, but it would be words in the heart. Lord, that you would write them on the tablet of our mind and our heart. Lord, help us to be good students, studying your word, memorizing your word, learning your word, so that we might be able to identify the false prophets that are out there. That, Lord, that we would not find ourselves being deceived and tricked and pulled away, but that we would know the way and that we would see the narrow path clearly and that we would walk on it. Lord, this we know. We cannot accomplish these things at all without the power of your Holy Spirit. And I pray this morning that you would fill each and every soul that is here today with the Holy Spirit, with the power that comes to be able to discern between the right hand and the left hand, to be able to know the will of God, to be able to have the strength to follow the will of God in their lives. And I would include myself, I would say us in that, Lord. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this day. Lord, would you go before us now? And in this holiday season, would you give us opportunities to be able to share the love of Christ with many? friends, co-workers, relatives, whoever it may be, that, Lord, that you would not only give us opportunity, but we would have the boldness to do so, and that you would put the words in our mouth, in our heart, and that we would fear not, that we would not be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Lord, speak to our hearts, speak through our hearts, and be honored and glorified, and let our works in our lives bring glory to your name. And Lord, we commit these things to you now in Christ's name. And everybody said, amen. Would you stand, please? Your love is like radiant diamonds bursting inside